Okay. Uh, great. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, work that's kind of built on work that I've done with uh, various linear combinations of collaborators over the past few years. Um, though I'm going to talk about like uh, a general overview and then kind of talk about one very specific application. Um, but uh, we've written a arguably two pedagogical review um, of the kind of general method that's on archive and then some of the results that I'll talk about at the end will hopefully be appearing in the next few weeks. And so just kind of to summarize at the beginning, like the main goal, the main punchline is um, we want to study quantum field theory and we're particularly interested in the case where the theory is strongly coupled. And uh, the method we're gonna talk about is gonna be numeric. And the goal is to try to study just dynamics of very general quantum field theories. And it's important to kind of highlight the word dynamics where I really wanna study kind of uh, real time observables. So we wanna work directly in Lorentzian signature um, and really try to measure um, many, many observables in generic quantum field theories. And so what sort of observables do we have in mind? Well, the most obvious is just the spectrum. If the theory has a mass gap, then I'd be interested in computing, say, the spectrum of bound states, starting with like single isolated states, and then you have kind of the multi-particle threshold. So, and I'm particularly interested in, as um, a physicist, in like the low energy observables, things that are far below some UV cutoff uh, lambda. But I don't just want the spectrum. Um, I really want to study dynamics. I really want to compute things like wave functions so that I can compute things being very optimistic, like uh, the parton distribution function for the proton. Um, in addition, we want to measure things like correlation functions to study dynamics with respect to time, to try to extract things like, say, E plus E minus to hadrons, um, if we could apply this to uh, QCD, which I'm going to argue that we can eventually. Um, OK, so this is kind of roughly what we want to do. So how are we going to get there? Um, the basic idea is kind of rooted in our modern understanding of quantum field theory, and our modern understanding is very simple. Um, in physical systems, there's typically a few kind of important energy or length scales, and if I go far above or far below those scales, then uh, the theory becomes approximately scale invariant and flows to or uh, and uh, goes to a fixed point at very low energies or at very high energies. And so I can just think of quantum field theory as just so-called renormalization group flows between these two fixed points. At high energy, I have some fixed point. At low energies, I have some fixed point. And I'm interested in all the dynamics between those two points. And, uh, and so this picture, and sorry, and it's crucial to say that these fixed points are described by, should correspond to scale invariant theories. And um, in local quantum field theory, I typically expect them to be conformal field theories. And so the kind of picture we have is that Quantum field theory, if I'm interested in low energy physics, secretly can be thought of as coming from some ultraviolet, some high energy conformal field theory that's been deformed by various um, interactions coupled with length scales that kind of set the scale for the problem. And so this picture is very suggestive. It suggests that all of the IR physics um, that we're interested in studying is secretly buried within uh, UV fixed points. And as the previous talk told us, um, universality actually tells us that there are many, many different fixed points that we could start from that in the IR can lead to the same point. And so actually this information is encoded in many different fixed points. And the only question is how to extract this. Nature is very good at this. How do we figure out a good method for doing this? And so the kind of strategy we're gonna use is we're gonna try to extract this UV data and figure out how it connects to the actual IR observables that we wanna measure in an experiment. And I just wanna stress that this problem as I've presented it is incredibly general. Like most problems that we study in physics can be phrased in this language as renormalization group flows coming from uh, ultraviolet uh, high energy conformal field theories. Okay, good. So the kind of motivation for thinking about things in terms of the conformal field theory at high energies or at short distances um, is kind of rooted in the so-called conformal bootstrap program, um, which is a, uh, a uh, very old program that recently in the past decade has seen kind of a resurgence in interest in um, determining the structure of conformal field theories. So I suspect this audience ranges from like experts in conformal field theory to people who don't necessarily interact with it as much. Um, really all you're going to need to know is what's on this slide, so we'll be really quick. Um, conformal field theories can be characterized by two things by their spectrum of local operators. So when I say spectrum, I just mean the scaling dimensions and spin quantum numbers 
of local operators. And then the OP coefficients that kind of connect these operators together. So the natural observable in CFTs are just correlation functions of local operators. If I kick the system over here, what happens over here? Um, one point functions are all zero, except for the trivial operator of the identity. Two point functions are completely fixed by just the scaling dimension, how these operators behave as I zoom in and zoom out. Three point functions are completely controlled by both those scaling dimensions and then so-called OPE coefficients that just couple these things together. And all higher point functions can be expressed in terms of these kind of building blocks. So when we talk about CFTs, we often talk about the CFT data as being just this list of scaling dimensions and OPE coefficients. But they're very, very constrained. If I hand you a random list of uh, scaling dimensions and OPE coefficients, they're not going to correspond to an actual valid CFT because they're highly constrained by things like conformal symmetry, locality, unitarity, um, that mean that there are very, very particular combinations that correspond to valid CFTs. And so the bootstrap program is really simple. It's just trying to figure out what are the specific combinations that are consistent with all of these constraints. And what's nice about this way of studying the problem is that it's inherently non-perturbative. I don't need any sort of like local Lagrangian description in terms of like underlying fields or anything like this. I can really phrase the problem just in terms of these very abstract objects of scaling dimensions and OP coefficients. And I can apply it in a general set of, a general number of space time dimensions. And so kind of the general goal of the conformal bootstrap program is to so-called map out the space of CFTs. Now, all that means is we're like, we often show pictures like this and this is in some abstract space corresponding to all possible lists of scaling dimensions at OP cost, like the full space of all possible quantum field theories. Um, and we're really trying to figure out the very specific points, the very specific uh, special theories, uh, special combinations of scaling dimensions and OP coefficients that correspond to valid CFTs. And so the kind of obvious natural next step, because I can think of quantum field theories as flows between these theories, is to use these as starting points to try to map out the highway system that connects all of them, which is the space of quantum field theories. And so the kind of just basic punchline or the kind of motivation of what we're gonna to try to do is to use the output of things like the bootstrap um, as a launching point to just study quantum field theory. Okay, great, this sounds all nice and grand, but how do we actually do it in practice? And so a long time ago, we took quantum mechanics and the world was incredibly simple. Dynamics were completely controlled by the Hamiltonian. We were introduced to the Schrodinger equation and we were just told, oh, you wanna know how the system behaves with respect to time? Perfect, evolve it with the Hamiltonian. So solving a theory meant something super concrete and very straightforward, which was just diagonalize the Hamiltonian. Find the set of eigenstates of this operator, express everything in terms of that basis. It's incredibly simple to apply. It's a very simple idea. But then we met quantum field theory and we were immediately told to forget all of this for very practical reasons. One is that at weak coupling, diagonalizing the Hamiltonian quickly becomes impractical. You can do it if you try to do old fashioned perturbation theory, you can compute the first order and second order corrections and you can keep going. And you find out that for even incredibly trivial theories, this becomes incredibly difficult. And so we, as a result, invented Lorentz invariant perturbation theory and started phrasing things in terms of Feynman diagrams to make things computationally useful. And at strong coupling, it's impossible. And it's impossible for a very simple reason. The Hilbert space is infinite dimensional and there's no obvious preferred basis. The kind of usual way we talk about quantum field theory is in terms of free field theories perturbed by interactions, but that Fox space basis is no longer a good basis. States are linear combinations of arbitrary numbers of particles. And so we have no idea how to diagonalize this infinite dimensional Hamiltonian. But what if we were less ambitious and we just wanted to diagonalize part of the Hamiltonian. And so the kind of strategy we're gonna take is what's known as Hamiltonian truncation. And it's an incredibly simple and very old idea originating in the Raleigh-Ritz method, which Raleigh initially worked on in like the mid 1800s. Um, and it's a simple approach for approximating the low eigenvalue, the low eigenvalue eigenstates um, of a Hamiltonian or of an operator. And the idea is very simple. Start with a complete basis of states, just some basis. Um, obviously, it's not the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, otherwise you would have solved your problem. So you just have some basis. It's, in, it's gonna be infinite dimensional. Then just truncate it. Say that, okay, my eigenstates are gonna be labeled by some parameter n. 
I'm going to just truncate this and only keep a finite dimensional subspace of my full Hilbert space. You can then construct a truncated matrix just by evaluating the matrix elements of a Hamiltonian within this finite dimensional subspace. This just gives you kind of a corner of the full infinite dimensional Hamiltonian, which I've labeled as H trunk. And then you just diagonalize this truncated matrix. It's finite dimensional. You can just do it uh, in Mathematica by hitting shift in, or typing eigenvalues. Um, and uh, you get out some set of eigen, uh, eigenvectors of this truncated matrix. And the basic idea is that if the basis of states I chose has large overlap with the low energy eigenstates of the full Hamiltonian, then this is a good approximation. And so the question just becomes kind of, what are efficient bases? What are nice bases? Like where in the Hilbert space do low energy states usually live? And of course, this is also a very difficult problem, but at least rephrases the problem as just trying to figure out good bases to truncate and try to study the low energy eigenvalues. Um, and I really want to stress just two important things. One, this is definitely, definitely not perturbation theory. Um, you're really including effects to all orders, even when you truncate uh, your Hilbert space, to all orders in the coupling, I mean. Um, and you're just exactly diagonalizing part of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so good. So the question is, what's a good basis? Well, motivated by the pictures I showed you a few slides ago, we want to think about our quantum field theory as coming from some UV conformal field theory. So let's just try to use the natural basis of that conformal field theory. And the natural observable, as I told you earlier, are just local operators. So let's just use those, organized by their scaling dimension and spin quantum numbers. Now, I'm interested in studying dynamics, and I'm interested in theories that are uh, translation invariant. Um, so it's much more convenient to work in momentum space. So my basis is incredibly simple. I just take local operators and Fourier transform them to momentum space. So my basis of states is just going to be labeled by O, or specifically like the quantum numbers of O, the scaling dimension and spin, um, or any, and any other quantum numbers I have, and then the momentum. And so these are very formally eigenstates of the quadratic Casimir um, of the conformal group, which is just expressed in terms of, say, scaling, like scaling translation, scaling dimension, sorry, scaling transformations, translations, special conformal transformations, and uh, rotations. And the only reason I'm showing you this is that the eigenvalues of the conformal Casimir are controlled by the scaling dimension and spin, and they roughly scale like the scaling dimension squared. So when I say the Casimir, the conformal Casimir, you can roughly think of that as a stand-in for the scaling dimension. And so the truncation we're gonna do is we're gonna specifically consider low dimension operators. Or more concretely, we're gonna truncate in the Excuse me, there is no audio actually. A local operator. And so this is nothing but just a CFT three point function for a transform to momentum space. And so the only important thing to point out is that this, as I showed you earlier, is just controlled by the OPE coefficients of your CFT. And so given the CFT data, I automatically, it's trivial to, const to construct the Hamiltonian. The scaling dimensions or the two point functions give you the basis, the OPE coefficients or the three point functions give you the individual matrix elements of the Hamiltonian. Yes. Conformal perturbation theory is if you were to then um, perturb, like do perturbation theory um, with respect to, say, the coupling or like the deviation from uh, marginality or something like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to instead do truncation where I'm going to like, ex like fully resum a like part of that perturbative series where I'm going to say like I'm only allowing a certain finite set of like intermediate states. 
and I'm fully resumming this. But it's a very analogous like, spirit to global perturbation. It is good. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll use that. Um, but yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it, it's the exact same spirit of the normal perturbation theory. We're just going to go farther numerically. Okay, great. So this is a general recipe for trying to compute the IR spectrum of quantum field theories solely from CFT data. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Uh, there's an error. That's good to know. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to find it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. So can you go back to the previous one? Yes. In this case, how are you interpreting that the uh, delta H? Yeah, sorry, I can't. Yeah. Sorry. How are you interpreting that the uh, prediction of delta H in the non truncated uh, state is small? That's the criteria you require. Good, 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 good. Uh, it's not so much a criteria I require as it, it's, it's necessary for this to be a good approximation. Yeah. Um, no, that's great. So uh, I have two answers for you. Um, one is just going to be the let's try it and see what happens, uh, which is a very lame answer. But uh, but uh, but two, um, we have so we haven't put this on any sort of like rigorous footing. Um, but um, very intuitively, um, the operators we're deforming by by construction have to have low scaling dimension. They have to be below. Uh, the number of space-time dimensions I have. I'm specifically interested in relevant operators. Mm -hmm. And then the operators I'm considering in my basis are also like low dimension operators. And so the kind of off diagonal ones, the ones that are mixing things with that are in my basis with things that I've thrown away by truncating are basically um, low dimension, low dimension, high dimension, through, like through my functions. Mm -hmm. And um, these are exactly the same things uh, that you can bound by convergence of the OPE and things like this. Um, and so we don't have any sort of rigorous proof, but just kind of very schematically, um, we expect these off diagonal uh, elements to be suppressed. And so this method should, uh, the expectation for convergence of this method kind of comes from or is inherited from like convergence of the OPE. But it's not, I mean, we haven't, there, there could be exceptions in the sense that statements about convergence of the OPE or statements about kind of like the average behavior of these guys. So you could imagine that there's like very special points, um, which is what leads me to my first answer, which is, all right, let's try it out and see. Kind of what happens, but that's kind of a rough intuition. Yes, there's a question in the back. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Yeah, 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 no, that's that's absolutely correct. So yeah, so you have to worry about higher order effects as well, um, which is why I said this is not a rigorous argument for why um, this has to converge. Um, but that's kind of our rough expectation for like the, the rough size of errors we would expect from this. But but you're absolutely right. Yeah. In practice, what we find is that uh, this seems to converge. Uh, polynomially with kind of the scaling dimension that I find that the errors seem to fall off like one over you know, like C max or delta max uh, to some power. But that's an experimental observation. We don't have like a proof that that has to happen every time. But yeah. I mean, that's absolutely that, correct. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yes, yeah. Cool. Okay. Uh, okay, 10 minutes left. So I'll. Try to be efficient with time. Um, okay, so just a quick summary: the inputs, CFT data, the outputs, all of the things. Uh, like uh, just the like the, the observables in quantum field theories, things like masses, wave functions of states. We can then use them to compute uh, observables like correlation functions, things like this. Yes. Sorry, if you say masses, uh, if you go back. So, so this doesn't mean that you, you want to see this uh, uh, infrared fixed point. Ah, good. No, thank you so much. I, I should have made this comment earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, okay, so the picture we have, thank you so much. Um, the picture we have is some UV fixed point that we're then deforming, and it's flowing to some QFT in the IR. And I want to be very agnostic about what this is. Um, it could have a max gap, it could itself be a new IR fixed point um, in the IR. And, um, and so, uh, and the idea is that this should work in both cases. And if the theory has a mass gap, then yes, I could extract information about the difference about, about the mass spectrum. And if it instead uh, the mass gap closes, I could learn things like trivialized motions of the or I mean sorry, the spectrum of scaling dimensions of the options to the IR. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, I'm not entirely sure what happened here, but I could tell you what you're missing. Uh, just a quick here. 
Um, okay, so there are two quick technical points I want to make. Um, the first is super easy to understand, so much so that you don't need this slide. Um, uh, when I define the states, which are defined down here, um, uh, there are Fourier transforms of local operators, uh, so they're, they're labeled by the momentum. Um, and uh, this momentum, let's say we're in 4D, or it doesn't even matter, they're, they're D vectors. Um, there are D minus one spatial ones, and because I'm interested in uh, translation invariant theories, I can just pick a particular uh, frame. So I can just kind of fix the particular spatial values I want to work on, and any frame is as good as any other. But there's also the energy, or to think more Lorentzian variant, kind of the invariant mass, like p squared. Um, and so this is a continuous label. And so what we need to do is we need to discretize this label in some way. So this is labeled by some spatial thing, p vector, and then uh, um, an invariant mass p squared. So we need to discretize. Um, all we're going to do to discretize, I guess it's going to be shown technically at the bottom of the next page, so I'll just do that. Okay, so this was the equation that was in big uh, font on the previous slide that was now hidden. Um, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take our kind of continuum of, thing, of uh, states, integrate them against some weight function, like integrate them over all invariant masses by some weight function vi um, up to some uv scale lambda, and then we're going to use some, that gives us some basis of kind of weight functions. Uh, they could be like say polynomials in the invariant mass over this interval or something like this. And then we're going to truncate these guys as well. So we're really going to do two truncations in practice. One, which is the important physical one, is scaling dimensions of operators. And then the other second one is just kind of the smearing or like these kind of just, I have like the set of resolution for each operator. But that is very computationally cheap. Adding a new operator is very difficult. Adding like more and more fine graining the kind of like continuous spectrum of uh, p squared is, uh, is harder for computational order. Um, but the second technical point uh, we need to make is that um, to define my Hilbert space or to define my Hamiltonian, I have to choose a uh, quantization scheme. I have to choose a, sp a slice setting of space time, space time to define my Hilbert space on. Um, what we are going to choose to work on is uh, light, uh, light cone quantization. And so all light cone quantization is, is uh, just you define light cone time, which is t plus some particular spatial direction. Here I've called it x. Um, and we're just going to define our system on these kind of null slices, these slices of fixed light cone time. And the reason we're doing this, which is also something that somehow vanished from this slide, um, is uh, for something very simple, which is that in light cone quantization, which I can roughly just think of as going to the infinite momentum limit, it's just boosting normal quantization to the infinite momentum frame. In light cone quantization, uh, some set of matrix elements of a Hamiltonian are going to vanish. And in particular, those mixing the vacuum with other states are going to vanish. And so this is just going to simplify our life by kind of reducing the set of um, matrix elements that we're going to have to deal with. I'm happy to talk about this more offline um, for why. But these are just kind of the two important things. We have to discretize our basis a little bit further, and we're going to work in like the OK. Um, okay, uh, okay, that's very weird. Uh, all right, great. Um, okay, so let's study a very different, so again, sorry. The method I just told you about is very general. Um, in principle, we can apply it to any conformal field theory in any dimension, study deformations of this to study general QFTs. Let's consider a particular example. So the example we're going to consider um, is we're going to start with free scalar field theory in two plus one dimensions in three in three space time dimensions. So our UV fixed point is just going to be free scalar field theory where we can easily compute all of the CFT data. That's one reason why we're going to start with, with like this example. Then the deformation we're going to add is going to be a mass term phi squared and a quartic interaction phi to the fourth. And um, ge in general, and then this phi to the fourth interaction has some coupling g. Um, but, uh, um, and uh, for general values of G, we can take items, take a, a basis of operators from the UV fixed point uh, from our UV theory of free field theory, compute a spectrum of operators up to some scaling dimension, which are just linear combinations of derivatives acting on the field phi. Um, that's going to be our basis. Uh, we can compute the resulting 
matrix elements, diagonalize it, compute the spectrum for generic values of the coupling. But if we tune the coupling to a very specific point, what we find is that the mass gap closes and we flow to a new IR fixed point that is in the same universality class as the 3D easy model. And so what's nice about this is it gives us a nice kind of sanity check um, where we can try to reproduce data from, say, the technical well bootstrap or other methods um, and uh, match our results onto that of the 3D easy model. But I want to stress that we can use this to study part of the fourth theory at any value of the coupling. It's just a nice kind of sanity check at this critical point compared to the easy model. OK. But, and because I only have a few minutes, I'm not going to get into this too much. Um, there's a complication, which is a very technical one, but very important, which is that the phi to the fourth theory in 3D, as many of you probably know, has UV divergences. If I specifically consider, where's the marker? They're on the board. Oh, they're on the board. Okay. Um, I, I really just need to draw a picture. If I consider this very famous like sunset diagram, which is just a correction to the mass um, of the field spot. So it's second order in perturbation theory by a quartic interaction. Can people see this or if it's too dark? Okay. Um, it's something everybody who's taken QFT has definitely seen. Um, and so uh, this is a correction to the mass. And just from simple power counting, you can see that this is going to go like g squared log of whatever my cutoff is. That's a lambda and that little one is the max. Um, so there are logarithmic divergences. What do we usually do to deal with these? What we usually do, and this is all on this slide, which is making stuff. Okay. Um, what we usually do to deal with these divergences is we just add a counter term. We just add a correction to the bare mass, which cancels this logarithmic divergence. But in Hamiltonian methods, it's more subtle. And the reason it's subtle is very, very simple. Let's say I have. I'm considering the leading correction to say not the one particle state, but say some n particle state. So I have a bunch of just kind of spectators. These are just lines doing nothing. Um, so this is some n particle states getting a correction by mixing with n plus two particle states going back to n particle states. This naively should be exactly the same. It should also be just logarithmically, like a logarithmic correction to the mass of this n particle system, um, logarithmically divergent in the cutoff. But in a Hamiltonian framework, when we impose the cutoff, we don't impose the cutoff directly on these loop momenta as we would just in continuum QFT. Instead, what we do is we put a cutoff on the total invariant mass of the intermediate state. This is just an artifact. This is just a consequence of dealing with Hamiltonian methods. When I truncate my basis, I'm truncating the set of all possible intermediate states. And so the cutoff I place is on the total mass of this whole system. And so the cutoff that this loop sees is controlled or affected by the fact that there's other guys here. Some of the invariant mass of the intermediate states is taken up by the spectator guys. And so this is just kind of an annoying complication of dealing with Hamiltonian methods. What this means is I need to construct kind of state-dependent counter terms. I can't just do a simple shift in the mass. Every single state is seeing a slightly different effective cutoff controlled by the other particles in the state. Um, and so I have to add this in uh, to deal with this. And so the punchline is basically, we do this. And I cannot believe none of these plots are here. Um, and uh, OK, so the punchline, you just have to trust me, um, is that, um, okay, is that uh, we can diagonalize the Hamiltonian, and we get a plot that was going to be incredibly <laughs> impressive. It looks like the following. On the x-axis, which I'll just draw here, Oh, whatever. The x-axis is coupling, what you would expect. I'm dialing some coupling G. And the y-axis is the spectrum of eigenvalues. So for free field theory, I have one guy at 1 times m squared. So I've got a two-particle continuum at 4m squared, three particles at 9m squared. And then what I find as I tune on, turn on the coupling is that these guys go down, as they should. And so as I tune the coupling, what I find is that the mass gap closes. And I see that the one, two, and three particle kind of thresholds all close at roughly the same points. And this is numeric, so of course there's like some points instead of line. Um, but, uh, but the punchline is that uh, we can, um, yeah, the punchline is basically that we can uh, compute um, 
the spectrum of the theory at a variety of couplings. And at each of these couplings, we can also compute observables, things like correlation functions and stuff like this. Um, okay, I'm gonna wrap up here. Um, and uh, I'll just advertise that I will be here with my laptop with these slides. Um, <laughs> people really are dying to see these. Um, and then the last thing I wanna say, and then I'll, and I'll be absolutely done, um, is uh, in this pedagogical review that we put out back in May, uh, we also paired with it uh, publicly available code. So very simple to use, Mathematica notebooks. Um, and uh, I just encourage anybody who's interested to play around with them and you can just study simple examples in one plus one dimensional field theory and study things like five to the fourth theory and reproduce plots like this. And it's designed to be as user friendly as humanly possible where you really just can open it up, hit shift enter and immediately make plots like this. So hopefully the link will be available online where you can talk to me. Um, but, uh, but yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>